So, I'm uh, here to talk about what happens to a subculture as it grows up. I'm here to talk about compromises, and I'm here to say nice things about hypocrisy. It's true. I'm not being ironic. So for the past 20 years, I've had the privilege of being a member of this movement, the movement that these days is known as the Nordic LARP movement, or something along those lines. And if you're here, if you are listening to this, then that means you're probably already somewhat familiar with Nordic LARP. And you've either bragged or you heard some of us brag about all the great things that Nordic LARP is doing, spreading around the world, uh, being used in education, being taught at schools, sneaking into galleries and uh, theatres, uh, and coming soon to a castle near you. <laughs> so I am here now as a ghost to remind you of a time before that. And the time I'm thinking of is um, the late 90s, or the early aughts, uh, which is when many of the ideas that inform this current movement today, um, many of the ideas come from that time. What was it like back then? I'm not going to spend a lot of time reminiscing. I have had to apologize repeatedly to many people over the years for my behavior during those years. Um, we were uh, busy writing angry manifestos. Uh, we were cliquish, we were pretentious, we were dismissive and had insane ambitions, the kind that only people in their early 20s can truly master. But those years were also driven by a sense that hidden in here, somewhere, in this LARP stuff, there was something that might be, just might be, feels like it might be world-changing. I wish I could tell you what that was, because I think it's still the case that we feel this. Am I right? Yeah, we, we have this sensation, those of us who work a lot with LARP, who work a lot with LARP design, that there's, some, there's something here that can be really world-changing, but we can't really put into words exactly what that is. And that, is, in a way, is the holy grail that we, we still keep on chasing. What I also recall was the effortless radicalism that infused almost everything we did. And the word we here contains a random amount of people, sometimes two, sometimes 50 people. Uh, these are, I look back in my old fanzine collection. Um, we were not particularly devoted to ideology <laughs> or loyal to any one label. We were not necessarily socialist, anarchist, or surrealist. But above, above all, I think it's fair to say uh, that we were free thinkers. Question everything. Take nothing from granted. Don't do what they tell you to do. But, oh yes, this one only exists in 30 copies, and you can't have one, because it's, it's one of the things I've had to apologize for. Yeah. But as we have grown wiser and older and apologized for our youthful sins and gained a position as a movement, however tenuous, in art, academia, and entertainment, then have we also lost something along the way? I am here to say, yes! Everything was better before, at least. There were some things we used to believe in that we no longer do. And I'm going to tell you about five things that I believe that we have lost. Five compromises. The first one is something I rant about at length in, uh, in an article uh, in uh, this year's Knutepunkt book, so I'll be brief this time around. Uh, but there was this notion, and we'd, we had, we'd, nobody said this out loud, it's not in any of the fan scenes. It's just that pretty much every major work that people talked about, played, and so on, cited in the first decade or so of Knutepunkt, of Knutepunkt and the tradition, Every work was, like, original. I mean, it came from the passions and the research of the people who made them. And sometimes somebody came along and they adapted a theater play for LARP. And this was interesting, too, because then we'll learn more things about it. But in general, we were neophiles. We wanted uh, our LARPs to be new. We wanted our LARPs to be different. We wanted our LARPs to not be the same one as last year. And then we can fast forward mm, a couple, uh, ten year, five, ten years, and we come to the present day. And a couple of years ago, we had uh, several very interesting LARPs. The Monitor Celestra, which took Battlestar Galactica to a Swedish naval destroyer. College of Wizardry, which turned a Polish castle into a College of Wizardry. We're suddenly seeing uh, vampire LARPs being played again, now under the Nordic banner. 
And just to be clear, I have nothing against these LOPs. I even played some of them, and I enjoyed them tremendously, and they've done in interesting things in terms of design. But <laughs> in their wake, I mean, sometimes, uh, sometimes successes bring their own momentum. And suddenly, this hair taboo, this idea that original work is good and necessary, and something we should value as a community, has kind of been broken. And there are more and more LARPs uh, that are kind of following the mold and borrowing uh, mostly big Hollywood uh, and uh, young adult publishing franchises and making LARPs in there. This is where I need my notes. Now, my question is, uh, besides the success of the LARPs, uh, that are based on these big brand IPs. Uh, they have strengthened a pre-existing trend, which is that LARP designers try to get into bed with the film industry and the computer games industry. We've been doing this for years or decades, but we're now we're doing it with increasing success. My question is, have we thought this through? I mean, LARPing is actually, I think, a perfect addition to a transmedia franchise. It fit, leads, fits neatly on the shelf between the collectible action figures and the overpriced amusement parks. It's a great way for brand owners to ensure that your devoted fans remain devoted. Now, have we thought through who those corporations are that own these IPs and what they're doing, how their marketing muscles and armies of lawyers are destroying or uncompeting independent culture across the planet? About the values hidden in their formulaic stories. Now, as mentioned, I rant about this at length, uh, so I'm not going to continue now because I have more compromises to talk about. <laughs> because after all, right, we have art. LARP in the art world. We have Nordic LARPs being played at Dramaten, in galleries, at the Berlin Biennale even. I mean, that's quite impressive. Uh, and infiltrating museums and theaters all over the place. Now, back in the late 90s, when LARPers across the Nordic countries declared that live role-playing was an autonomous form of art, a medium worthy of serious consideration and recognition. You see, I sometimes slip into my younger self here. Uh, <laughs> then this is what we had in mind, right? Right? Not quite. Our dream was not to stage a LARP at the National Theatre. Our dream was to burn the institutions of passive art and passive entertainment to the ground and construct in their place uh, glorious palaces devoted to truly participatory and co-creative LARP or art. Now, this does not mean that doing LARP in the art context is bad, but if we are to be honest to our younger selves, we have to admit that we have failed to build institutions that support true participatory art. Instead, we are sometimes brought into sideshows, diversions, interesting sidetracks. And ultimately, when we do that, when we fill that role, we strengthen the institutions. We do not necessarily strengthen the LARP movement. I mean, in addition, we've always been asked, ever since there were LARPers, we've been asked to please do LARP for an audience. Come here, do LARP for us. Okay, here's your character. What? You mean, you mean I actually have to play? You know? And we usually said no, because what's the point of participatory if there is an audience? I mean, how can you get people to actually get LARP if we don't get them to play it? But in the art context, increasingly people are saying, yeah, yeah, you can have an audience. Now, here, look, look at the weird LARPers LARPing. Next week, we'll have some authentic hip-hop artists showing their gangster ways, and the week after that, we'll have a, another slight diversion. Third compromise. It's not a game. Now, the Scandinavian word spill, spill, spell, has always translated very badly to the English word game. We sometimes slipped up and said game, but uh, after all, our form, Nordic LARP, is characterized by how it values collaboration over competition, how it disregards rules and mechanics in favor of creative spontaneity. I mean, there are broad definitions of game that can contain LARP, just as there are broad definitions of religion or society that can also contain Nordic LARP. Uh, 
but that would be then doing that kind of analysis is a bit niche. It's not necessarily a general purpose discussion. So the thing is, if you Google or look around Google Scholar and look, look for Nordic LARPs, you'll find plenty of academic articles that are written about Nordic LARP and that use the word game, sometimes with it without bothering to define it. Now, of course, in research, uh, you might use a perspective because you find it fruitful. Surely, studying LARP as if it was a game can yield interesting perspectives, just as studying LARP as drama or LARP as ritual can yield interesting perspectives. But then, there isn't a lot of research funding going on for research on rituals or drama these days. I really wanted to study theater science at the University of Oslo, but then I shut down the whole department. You know, but there's plenty of research funding for games, because every little state in Europe dreams of producing academics who educate game de designers, who then go off and start geek sweatshops where programmers are paid in pizza and cred, but put out blinky little addictive things on your mobile phones, so they might take away a whole lot of your time and a bit of your money, which is ultimately converted into tax earnings for this little European state. Whew. Now, I mean, I'm impressed with what academics manage to achieve within these very strange funding systems that you have to live with. Uh, but again, if we look back, if we use the threshold of the younger us, uh, then, um, you know, is this, is this what victory looks like? <laughs> you know, as, as Jörg mentioned earlier, if you read the early Knutepunkt books, we, we have some very strange ways of speech, but there was an underlying dream there an underlying dream of being able to articulate uh, in theory, in research, what live role-playing was about and solve problems of interesting to live role-players on our own terms, not those of well, computer game studies, for example. And that dream, you know, is basically, I mean, maybe in a decade it'll be proven wrong, but at the moment I think it's not happening. So I have to go back to the amateur theater, theory people. Okay, so, so far, I, have, uh, I may have lost some friends amongst the uh, entertainment LARPers, and amongst the art LARPers, and amongst the research LARPers. Um, who's left? <laughs> so, educational role-playing. I mean, what's not to like about educational role-playing? <laughs> And it's a venerable field. People have been doing educational role-playing since the 50s or 60s. And um, these days, I mean, we take a bit of pride that the field is actually dominated by people who learned the ropes during Nordic LARP. We're infiltrating a pre-existing community. And we're not sideshows. So what could I possibly, or the younger me, possibly have against edu LARP? It makes kids happy. It helps them learn in new and creative ways. But again... Have we thought this through? <laughs> As we enter schools or supplement them or seek to take over their curricula, we are also strengthening those institutions. We are legitimizing institutions that lock up young human beings for 9, 12, 14 years. That's super good. High on the human development index. 14 years of our brief lives and force us to learn a curriculum negotiated between government and industry, typically. Sometimes there are some religious people involved as well. Now, in our schools, we used to force children to learn with, like, sticks uh, or carrots sometimes. But these days in the Scandinavia, I mean, it's, you know, it's all very cuddly, and the curricula say things about the whole human being and independent thought and so on. I mean, we basically just replaced 1984 uh, with Brave New World, you know? <laughs> as long as that stuff is mandatory... <laughs> as long as we're talking about teaching and not about learning then we are contributing to an oppressive institution, also as edulorpers. Now, I might come through as a bit of an extremist here. <laughs> but my values are actually pretty straightforward. I believe that the individual, if given access to facts with a mind that is open to reason, is actually capable of making wise, pragmatic and morally sound decisions. This is not an extreme point of view. This is the point of view that underlines democracy, that underlines our legal systems. But from those values, it follows that exposing the individual to hype, spin, coercion, manipulation, these are bad things. They prevent wise and morally sound decisions. So I think a century from now, when people look back at, at today, they're going to look at our school system the way we look at indentured servitude and debtors' prisons. 
So, that was the edulopers. Now, who's left? All <laughs> oh, right, me. <laughs> or, uh, people, li people like me, the purists, who can point out every single compromise we're making everywhere else. Now, I think the thing about the four compromises I've talked about so far is that they're frequently, though not only, frequently made uh, by people who are incorporating LARP into their careers. And do not get me wrong, we need people to make LARP into a career. I think we have reached the hard limits right now of how much knowledge and skill can be sustained by volunteers spending their free time. In order for LARP to progress, I think we need people to continue to develop their skills and their understanding. And that, in many cases, requires that they need to do it full time. The reason, the only reason I can afford to be a purist in this community is because I make my money from financial services. <laughs> Let he who is without sin throw the first, first stone and so on. Now there's an ethical industry for you. We purists, we come in all flavors. Some of them will raise social media shitstorms if you serve meat at your lap, while others will raise an even bigger shitstorm if you don't. Money will demand that you single-handedly resolve centuries of structural discrimination and all other world problems besides in your casting process. And then I have my own pet peeves, which you've just heard some of. And you can't satisfy all of us, not if you're making a lot, not if you're trying to survive in this movement, in this world. You probably can't even satisfy your own standards. I mean, in general, it's really hard, you know. Most of us are deeply aware of the climate crisis, and we still fly airplanes, we still ride around in cars. And living a life of perfect integrity isn't necessarily a good alternative. I mean, if all the people who know, actually know something about the climate refuse to fly to the conferences where they discuss the climate, then I know who will turn up for those conferences, you know. We've got to participate in society one way or the other, and that means negotiating this confusing world of moral and ethical standards. Which is why the solution I propose to all of this, the LARP questions and the non-LARP questions, is not purity. Uh, the, this is the purists, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> the solution I propose is hypocrisy. Now, hypocrisy means that you say one thing and then you do another. <laughs> the priest who shouts from the pulpit, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his oxen, and then the next day is found in his neighbor's wife's bed, naked, eating hamburgers made from those oxen. <laughs> that priest is a hypocrite. Now, Neil Stevenson uh, has a very interesting observation in one of his novels where neo-Victorians a hundred years from now look back on our present day uh, and uh, say, how weird that back in those days, in the early 21st century, they thought hypocrisy was the ultimate sin. And I think he has a point there. Because we subscribe to so many different beliefs and belief systems that it can be really hard and bewildering to figure out a moral scale by which you judge your own actions and those of others. And the result of that is we don't. We look at whatever moral scale they themselves preach, and then we judge them according to that standard. It's a simple shortcut. But the alternative to being hypocritical about our compromises is that we internalize them. And we internalize stuff all the time. We figure out that we want to or need to do something that is a bit iffy, according to our current values, and so we replace those values with some new values. And according to our new values, the thing that we're doing isn't iffy at all. It's wise or clever or appropriate, or it's just how the world works. But of course, I'm just talking about myself. Obviously, nobody listening to this has ever internalized any compromises. Every opinion you hold is, is the result of calm and careful deliberation based on only facts and reason. Am I right? <laughs> yes. Uh, so the problem with internalization, though, is that then we lose sight of the truths that we did, did hold true before. And of course, not everybody was on board with the stuff that I've talked about so far, about the radical years of the early Nordic uh, LARP community, not then, not now. But some of us had, have held these ideals, and we have changed them. And the problem then is that we lose sight of these things that we've discovered we thought were true and important. And we replace them with beliefs that are more convenient. In other words, we don't need to worry about betraying the purists. The three people we need to worry about betraying are ourselves. And compared to that, I think hypocrisy is the preferable road. And by preferring hypocrisy, I mean that we and the people around us should accept that we make compromises. But we should refuse to internalize them. Instead, we should try to live with them.
at peace. And of course, when the time is ready to stop being hypocrites, when you see a chance, when there is an opportunity or something is just nagging you too much, then you can let go of the compromises and again act uncompromising. And within the community, I think it's valuable if we can still speak to each other with brutal honesty, <laughs> which is part of being a hypocrite. You can say one thing and then you can do another. So here's the thing, that when we dispense with the compromises, when we do so with good judgment at the right time and refuse to compromise and give not a single inch, then that can be an incredibly powerful act. These people up here were all strategically non-compromising, and by being strategically and wisely non-compromising, they changed the world we live in, usually for the better. I'm not claiming that we are like them, I'm claiming that we can be, and can aspire to that. And in the midst of all I've said about the good old days, and all the compromises we made and so on, then that is the thought I would hope that someone here remembers. Thank you very much for listening.